Well, welcome. Welcome on this beautiful Wednesday here in the DMV. We are the Health, Wellness, and Lifestyle Program, hosted by myself, Linda Dorman, and my wonderful forever co-host, the Honorable Dr. Donna Christensen. And we broadcast on the OurTV.network platform, which can be found on Roku. We are excited today to introduce our guest, who will talk with us about all things related to kidney disease, with legislation, how we as health consumers can really wrap our heads around dealing with the health disparities and how we can improve our own health as it relates to avoiding and preventing kidney disease. So I want to welcome to the program, Dr. Christensen, are you there? How are you this morning? I'm going to say, oh, um, um, oh I hope is. I'm coming through clearly today. Well, you're coming Good in. Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, yes, yes indeed. It's wonderful to have uh, LaVarne Burton from AKF with us today. It is absolutely wonderful because this is a subject that we haven't had a chance to really talk about in depth. We've talked about it through as it relates to uh, organ donation and uh, individuals' testimonies, but this is important that we have uh, Ms. LaVarne Burton, who's the president and chief executive officer of the American Kidney Fund. And that fund happens to be located right here in the great state of Maryland, where I'm located. Uh, Ms. LaVarne Addison Burton, we thank you so much for coming to the program. And I want to give um, some of your background because it is very, very steeped in a lot of amazing things that you have accomplished in the health space. So, um, Ms. Burden has led the organization in its acronym AKF, which we'll refer to in the program, since 2005. And as a number of Americans living with kidney disease has grown to a staggering 37 million, so has the need for the programs and services offered by AKF or American Kidney Fund. Um, but before that time, as uh, in, before 2005, Ms. Burton served as the executive secretary for to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, one of our major and very large federal agencies here in the U.S. Uh, for those who are listening in other parts of the world, where she managed policy development and regulations and was advisor to the secretary of the federal government's, as I mentioned, largest domestic agency. Uh, prior to that, she served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Budget Policy at the same agency, which we, in its acronym, we call it HHS, and as Senior Budget to uh, Analyst to the Budget Committee to the U.S. House of Representatives, advising the committee on funding policy and legislative positions for Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and other health programs. And of course, we always mention all the other things that you do in addition to your normal day job, which is remarkable. And that is serving as member and past chair of the National Health Council Board of Directors, among other uh, advisory councils to the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Disease at the National Institutes of Health and many, many other organizations. And so I could probably spend the next hour going over your uh, bio because it's so impressive, but we are so grateful that you have um, will join us today in this conversation and give us some real important insights into kidney disease and what the work that you're doing at the American Kidney Fund. So a grand welcome to you, Ms. Burden. How are you? I am fine and thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. And most of all, thank you for the opportunity to be here and to talk about this really important subject. Fantastic. Well, you know, let's just hop right in. Let's start with that organization and then we'll kind of drill down to talk about the disease itself and, and all of the peripheral activity. So first tell us what is the, or what, yeah, tell us what is the American Kidney Fund, its mission, um, what it focuses in on and how uh, we should be uh, become very well educated in the organization and ultimately donors, because I always like to make a plug for donations. Thank you so much. We really appreciate that. Um, the American Kidney Fund's mission is really very simply stated uh, to fight kidney disease because we want everyone who has the disease or who is at high risk for the disease to have the best possible outcome and the best health possible. Uh, uh, I am so delighted that Dr. Christensen joined our board a few years ago and has just been such a major contributor to the work of the American Kidney Fund. But we carry out our mission of helping people fight kidney disease in a number of ways. A prime way is awareness, just to make sure that those who have the disease and those who may be at high risk understand that risk and know what they need to look for. 
Um, there's education to help people understand the progression of the disease and what they can do to prevent it or how they can achieve the best outcomes by adhering to regimens and to understand what those care regimens are if they already have the disease. We have financial assistance programs for those who cannot afford to pay for their health care. We will pay the health insurance for people who are on dialysis or who've recently had transplants. And we just have, we, we've worked very hard with regard to policy, both at the federal level, the state level as well, because, you know, healthcare policy is so important when you're dealing with a disease that is quite frankly, not all that well known, where you definitely need more research to better understand and to be able to fight the disease. Um, and so we are very much on the forefront of seeking legislation at the federal level and the state level that will support those who have this disease and who are at risk of it. That so, is a well-rounded organization. It uh, is. Yes. And they have done some, they've helped some of our um, patients here, especially after the hurricanes. So we're really grateful for that. But um, you talked about preventing or delaying end-stage renal disease. What are some of the steps that an individual can take and who might be mo most at risk? Well, you know, the, the thing about kidney disease is it really is another one of those silent diseases. Mm -hmm. Kidney disease pro usually progresses very slowly over a long period of time, even decades. And you may have no symptoms until you're actually in full-blown kidney failure. Mm -hmm. So we want to step back and think about if I don't know I have it by the way my body is functioning, what else can I look for that might give me some indication that I have some stage of kidney disease or that I'm at high risk for kidney disease? And one of the things that you really look for is whether you or your family members have high blood pressure, have diabetes, whether somebody in your family blood relative uh, has been on dialysis, has experienced kidney failure. Um, if you're African-American in particular, then you want to be concerned about it. Um, if you've got any genetic history in your family of kidney failure. So those are some of the kinds of things that you can look for. Also, uh, Hispanic Americans, Hispanics also have a higher incidence. Um, Black Americans, unfortunately, have the highest incidence of kidney failure. And, and why do we have an understanding as to why that is, um, that we have that predisposition for the highest Ish, uh, number of kidney disease uh, cases in the states. That's a very, that's very daunting. Being African American, right? Um, it is. Yeah, I think yeah. for all three of us, we sit here and we look at each other mm -hmm. and we realize that what I just said means that all three of us are at higher risk. Um, we do have some idea as to why. Um, the two diseases that I mentioned, diabetes probably accounts for half the cases of kidney disease. Mm -hmm. High blood pressure also significantly contributes. Um, there's been some recent work on a gene, APOL1, and that gene also contributes greatly uh, to the much higher incidence of kidney disease and kidney failure uh, among African Americans. The National Institutes of Health, uh, specifically the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases, has been doing a lot of work on that. And that is something that we certainly want to follow very closely and we want to understand um, that better. But I want to make a distinction as well. There's a distinction between the disproportionality of just having kidney disease versus being in kidney failure. Mm. When you look at the incidence of kidney disease at its various stages, early stages, there really is not such a great inequity for blacks versus others. It's in kidney failure, where over a third of the people who are on dialysis, for example, are African-Americans, even though we represent only 13% of the population. And you know, when you go back, you have to think about the fact that because this disease does not have early symptoms, it's a matter of, are you getting early preventive care, just general health care, preventative health care? Are you getting the test that would that might indicate some reduction in your kidney failure? And if you don't have access to comprehensive health care, if you're not getting regular 
annual uh, physicals, you might not have some of those early warnings that might help you deal with this disease. And so you progress, continue to progress very slowly over the years, dealing with other health issues as well, which may also adversely impact your kidney function. And then all of a sudden you find yourself in kidney failure. So it's, it's just really critical when you think about kidney disease that you've got to think about the overall healthcare system and access uh, to healthcare for people of color, for underserved communities. And, you know, last week we had uh, Dr. Under, Underwood on, and we talked about heart disease and some of those same uh, social and economic factors uh, play have a role to play here too. Not only access to healthcare, but access to healthy foods, um, having uh, a good educational system so that people are health literate. And so there's a lot that happens around and not specifically medical that um, impacts it as well. And in the Virgin Islands, where we have a high um, incidence of diabetes, um, we have a lot of people at risk and our dialysis units are, are full and overflowing. My goodness. Well, I think you touched on something really important, Dr. Christensen, um, in the conversation that those are the health determinants, those social determinants that drive health care uh, quality of uh, from the provider standpoint and the ability to connect in with their patients and then also the patients, their ability to get the adequate amount of treatment that uh, succumb to disparities. Getting that information, that education is very critical, but then also having to be in communities that are health focused, health centric through foods, clinics, um, the ability to really have uh, walking parks, things that get people out moving and understanding that this is not something that they have to live with. If it's caught in time, kidney failure, would you say by and large, um, Ms. Burden, can, can, are we, should we think of it more as we do in other health issues, a lifestyle that it's because of our lifestyle that we get to this stage of potential kidney failure or nearing kidney failure, um, having passed through the disease process in states? That's a, yeah, that's a very significant factor, but I, but I wouldn't just limit it to, to lifestyle. Certainly lifestyle changes are what you need to do if you're at high risk in order to prevent it. Uh, as Dr. Christensen said, you need to eat healthy, uh, be on a healthy diet. Uh, you need to be at a healthy weight. Uh, you need to exercise. You need not to smoke. All of those things that, you know, that we tick off, that we say these are things that will lead to a healthier outcome, to a healthier um, person. Uh, yes, you definitely need to do those. But we also do have to look seriously at why is there this increased risk? And we have to look, in, in looking at that, we have to look at why is there an increase of diabetes? And certainly a lot of that is diet. Uh, and lifestyle, but there are also are genetic issues. Mm -hmm. And we have to look at those as well. What puts you at a higher risk? Uh, understanding what puts you at the higher risk and then being able to do something about it is really critically where the lifestyle changes uh, come into play. And that's another area where, where we have really focused at the American Kidney Fund is better understanding there. When, when, we, when it comes to diabetes and high blood pressure, we all know that and have known for years that those two diseases account for about two thirds. But we also know that even in instances where people are doing what they need to be doing in terms of lifestyle, that many people are still at higher risk and that there are sometimes genetic reasons behind that and other causes that we do not necessarily know. We've started a project called Unknown Causes of Kidney Disease because mm. it makes a difference what your treatment should be depending upon the cause. And because diabetes and high blood pressure are so prevalent and so much the cause, particularly in our communities, that you go into the doctor, and especially if you're in full-blown kidney failure, they want to get you, and understandably so, into dialysis as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. And if you happen to have high blood pressure or diabetes, the assumption is made, jumping to a conclusion here, that, well, that must be the cause. And if that assumption is made and it's not true, then the treatment that you get may not be the best treatment for what's going on with your body. You may even be fortunate enough to get a transplant. 
And we've had people who've even gotten multiple transplants and those tra transplants fail. And they fail because we haven't dealt with the underlying real cause. Yes, you've got diabetes. Yes, you've got high blood pressure, but there's something else going on. And so one of the things that we are pushing very hard for on the legislative front is to both expand the education that's available on genetic testing, as well as the insurance coverage and availability of that coverage, because people need to understand not only where they are with regard to their kidney function, but they know, need to understand what's pushing me to a decline in my kidney function. Wow. So you, you, that, that's critical. And we applaud the American Kidney Fund for having such a broad stroke in how it addresses this issue of kidney disease, chronic kidney disease, and kidney failure from a very holistic perspective. It's, it's a great organization in that regard. Um, let's make sure that individuals know the, as we're, as we're talking and as those who are listening in may want to actually Google or somehow um, go along with us. The website is kidney, www.kidneyfund.org. That's kidney, K-I-D-N-E-Y fund, F-U-N-D.org. Um, I want to ask uh, Ms. Burden a little bit now about the symptoms, because we've talked about the disparities. We've talked about the social determinants. We've talked about, mm -hmm. we touched on some things and we'll continue to drill down a little bit further into the weeds on this subject. But for those who are still asking themselves them, their, themselves the question, how do I even know I'm approaching kidney disease or I'm approaching kidney failure? What can you share with us as some of the symptoms? Mm -hmm. And but, can I just piggyback on that to talk about what kind of conversation should you have with your physician? Oh, yes. Very absolutely. Important. Absolutely. And, and I think we ought to go there first because that is, I mean, that is absolutely key to addressing um, kidney disease issues and trying to do something to prevent it or slow down the progression of kidney failure. Very simply, you really need to have a conversation with your doctor and say, you know, I'm interested in knowing how my kidneys are functioning, especially you can add information if you know it. My mother and my father, some other relatives have had kidney disease, have been in kidney failure. And so I need especially to be paying attention. Or if the doctor has already diagnosed you with diabetes or high blood pressure, you wanna say, okay, doctor, I know I need to address those diseases, but I also know that kidney disease can result from those. What can I do as best I can to protect my kidneys? Just making the doctor aware of the fact that you're interested. When you go to the doctor for your physical, you know, we all get two or three pages of various lab results. Included in there are lab results that will help you understand your kidney function, your blood tests and your urine tests. The results of those will help you understand that. Make sure that you're asking the doctor or healthcare provider about what does that mean for me? Where am I on this, on this scale? So those are some of the kinds of things that you want to do before you get to the point that you have symptoms. Because when you start to have symptoms, when you have, you know, we, we, we sometimes flu-like symptoms, but very severe flu-like symptoms, um, drive people to the doctor and they think, well, I'm gonna get something for treating the flu. And the doctor says, you are now in kidney failure. We hear that so often. We need immediately to send you for dialysis. Uh, some of the things that happen are um, very swollen ankles. Um, you know, your typical flu symptoms, as I mentioned, difficulty urinating, those are all things that might suggest, they suggest many things, but they may also suggest uh, kidney failure. Yeah, and, and most of those um, lab results are picked up on a routine um, exam, your routine lab. So it's just a question, asking about where am I, uh, are those test results indicating that I have a, a, the beginning of kidney disease or um, or not? Yeah. And and Linda, you mentioned you, you mentioned the American Kidney Fund website. Yes. Go to our website, and the, and you can you know you can go there and search for how do I talk to my doctor, 
and it will give you some guide on on questions that you can raise with your doctor you know and we as i said we all get those results now with you know it seems like a thousand test results but you know two or three pages we need to read those results and we need to begin to understand them and carefully follow them from one exam to another and when something changes we need to ask that conversation, have that conversation about why is this changing? And very importantly, what can I do about it? Because, yes. you know, one of the things that is different about kidney disease that, that in a sense is positive compared to some others is that if you are diagnosed in time, there really is something you can do about it. You can, you can increase exercise. You can change diet. You can make sure that you're getting adequate sleep. You can change, you know, alcohol, reduce alcohol or eliminate it. You can stop smoking. All of those kinds of things will help you, even if you are at some stage of uh, chronic kidney disease, you can slow it down and hopefully prevent yourself from being in the kidney failure. The, um, the information that we get from NIH says that over 90% of the people who are experiencing some stage of kidney disease do not know it. That is, well, you know, it's important to know the symptoms mm -hmm. and they can be subtle and they can appear to associate with other issues, but you've given us a strong directive in terms of being aware of what those symptoms are and not undercutting the fact that they could be a sign of chronic uh, kidney disease, or you're moving into that stage and you need to have the quality conversations, the competent conversations with your healthcare provider. And I think we take it one step further in terms of that. And that is to, as you mentioned, taking a look at all the papers they give you and know your numbers, know what the test means, and really ask the questions. I think sometimes in uh, communities of color, in particular, at least those that I've talked to, will say, I don't want to know. I don't want to know the information. I somehow don't want to know because I'm predisposed to it being bad news. Mm -hmm. We're saying, and what you've just said is so important for our listeners and our viewers to understand, it, there, there's opportunity to reverse some of this damage through some lifestyle shifts, through medication, and through a completely different focus on what you see and how you treat your body. And I think that's critical. I'm wondering... I'm wondering, uh, Dr. Christensen and, and, and Ms. Burden, if people really understand the importance of our kidneys. Um, we have about two minutes left in the actual first half of our program. And I, I, you know, going through your website was an educational maze for me. I just navigated everywhere and I love looking at info, you know, sheets and, and uh, fact sheets that are so helpful and break it down that one I found quite interesting, and that was an education on what exactly are my kidneys and what do they do in my body and for me. Mm -hmm. um, so let's touch a little bit while we have yeah. a few questions. It is something that people really don't think about much. So it's an important issue to bring to the fore. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, it, it absolutely is. Your kidneys don't function well. Put simply, your body starts to poison itself. It retains waste and fluid and chemicals, um, and, it, and it turns in on itself and starts to poison itself. The function of the kidneys is to keep the fluids moving out, to keep excess things that you don't need in your body moving out through your urine, through you know a sweating, those kinds of things. And if they're not functioning, all of those nasty things stay in your body. Well, we're going to talk more about the function because I learned so much from the website. So while we take this break, we encourage everyone to go out to the uh, www.kidneyfund.org. We'll be right back with Ms. Burden from the American Kidney Fund and Dr. Donna Christensen. This is Linda Dorman on the health, wellness, and lifestyle segment of the Reset Program. We'll be right back after this quick break. Thank you. This is your Bloomberg Real Estate Report. I'm Denise Pellegrini. Median home prices up about 10% in December from a year ago in places like Massachusetts, but single-family home prices there stayed the same from the previous month, and condo prices actually slipped in December compared to November. But Don Henry Ruffini, new president of the Massachusetts Association of Realtors, says this might not signal much of a slowdown. We are seeing a little bit of a slowdown, but that really kind of leans itself into this time of year where we would typically see a little bit of a slowdown. And she says any slowdown you might think you're seeing could be relative. 
our our old uh, our old system of real estate, yes, it used to pick back up in March, April, but we are still seeing strong housing sales. Um, buyers are out looking. The interest rate is great. So people are still thinking about real estate. So which homes are the hottest right now? Redfin says nationwide, the most intense bidding right now is for those priced between 800000 and a $1 million. And that's your Bloomberg Real Estate. This is your Bloomberg Real Estate Report. I'm Denise Pellegrini. Looks like demand for office space is strong if you're in the right place, according to John Gates, CEO of America's Markets at JLL. We see faster recovery in Phoenix. We see faster recovery here in DFW. We certainly see it. Austin is almost at pre-pandemic levels. Nashville is a great example of what historically has been a secondary market that's growing very, very rapidly. Atlanta is uh, all of North Carolina, South Carolina actually growing. And then Florida, Miami has exploded in growth. And they're back at pre-pandemic levels as well. And Gates also says the other landlords getting rewarded right now are those with high-end office space with lots of amenities. It's food, uh, services, concierge services, not just even workout facilities, but specific classes, whether it's yoga or fitness classes and other, other things. There is a very clear flight to new and exciting and, and sort of cool, if you will. And that is your Bloomberg Real Estate Report. and Lifestyle with Linda Dorman and my co-host, the Honorable Dr. Donna Christensen. And we have been very fortunate to have with us uh, Ms. Laverne Burton, who is president and CEO of the American Kidney Fund, located right here in the great state of Maryland, where I'm located. And Dr. Christensen is in the beautiful island of St. Croix. And we were just talking just a few minutes um, while uh, Ms. Burton uh, manages to come back into the studio. We were talking about exactly what the, what the kidney, what it what its functions are. And one of the things that surprised me, and of course I know that it regulates the fluids as we've talked about, but it controls chemicals as well as the fluid in your body. 
Um, it helps to control your blood pressure, which is why blood pressure is such a critical factor in understanding how to manage that in order to avoid moving into kidney disease, chronic stages, and then ultimately kidney failure. And it helps to keep your bones healthy. Now, if you didn't know that, raise your hand. Okay, so mm -hmm. raise my hands. And even more so, it helps your body make red blood cells. Uh, if you didn't know that, raise both hands. So here's both of my hands. And so why it's important that we manage to keep and maintain our very important um, vital organ to our body, our kidneys. And so we're glad that you're able to get back in. Live television can be a little tricky, but we're so happy that you're here, Ms. Burton, because this conversation is educating me. Um, I have shared openly with the public that I am someone that has suffered from high blood pressure in the past. I've been on medication. I've been off. I've changed lifestyle. I'm back off. So I'm really excited about that, particularly um, because I'm African-American and because I've had uh, that health state, my risk is even higher. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about why it's a little bit higher in the U.S. Virgin Islands where Dr. Christensen is broadcasting from. I just don't understand that. Is there something special happening here um, as a health community? Um, not Well, first of all, we have a, a high incidence of diabetes. And um, there, there should not be problems in access, but getting individuals to really control their diet and to, and to stay on their medication has been a problem off and on. Not as much now as it was before because uh, we have much more access to not only medication, but to physicians, but it has been, it has been a problem. And then we have a fair amount of hypertension as well. And again, just maintaining the control. I, I sit on a federally qualified health center board as well. And you know, it's something that we focus on because it's it's been not where we would like it to be, the control of our diabetes and the control of our hypertension. Um, so it's a, it's an area of focus for us, which will be preventive uh, if those, um, because they can lead to, to chronic renal disease and end-stage renal disease. We just have a, a lot of end-stage renal disease here. And I don't think it's different to any other place where you have a large African-American and Hispanic pop population and, and where those diseases are prevalent. That's interesting. So what we're saying is, um, again, in communities where there's a high concentration of people from uh, uh, people of color, as in St. Croix, we have to really wrap our hands around two major things, diabetes, as well as high blood pressure, because it seems that these are all uh, sister related diseases that go one with the other. It so might be interesting to, to do some genetic uh, look, take a genetic look at some of our population. We're from mm -hmm. mostly from West Africa. And I, I believe that that particular gene is found in people mostly from that part of Africa. So it may be um, worthwhile to have NIH take a look at our population and see how prevalent that gene might be here, which makes me brings me to research as well, because um, that's another focus of uh, the American Kidney Fund. And um, we're learning things we complain about the changing things that we're learning about um, the the COVID virus, but we're learning things about kidney disease as well. And um, I remember when I was practicing collecting 24-hour urines to do <laughs> the glomerular filtration rate to to look at where a person's kidney function was. And I, I'll, I'll, I'll let Laverne talk a little about what we're learning about that. And also when I was in Congress, we noticed that uh, African-Americans may have needed a different level of medication, mm -hmm. epigen, for example, to keep their red blood cells uh, at a higher level. So there are differences and research is important. Yeah. Go ahead, Laverne. Research. But, yeah, but those things are really, that Dr. Christensen just mentioned, really are so important. I mean, we're learning a lot more about, we talk about health and equity, and we know the issue of not having adequate early access to health care. Uh, we know the issues around the affordability of medications and continuing health care. I think we've talked less about medical standards and guidelines and how some of them really um, 
tend to be biased uh, against certain populations. African-Americans is what we're talking about. Glomerular filtration rate. Um, as you mentioned, I came to the American Kidney Fund back, um, seems unbelievable, but it's been a bit more than 16 years ago. And I started understanding these, uh, learning about these issues and EGFR, uh, estimated glomerular, glomerular filtration rate was one of the first things that I heard. It's been the gold standard for how do you determine how a person's kidneys are functioning, starting with the stage one up to a stage five. Stage one, mean, you know, meaning you're, you're, you're in a good space at stage one. Um, but as you move down there to stage five, your four and five is when you begin to be in kidney failure. And that, that has been the standard for the entire uh, uh, medical community. Well, there's an issue about how EGFR is calculated. Mm -hmm. um, lots of research had been done before it was developed, but then somewhere along the line, it was decided that a special race factor should be added for black people. And there was an assumption about body mass and other things about uh, for, for black people that said, well, these numbers don't mean the same thing for blacks as they do for other people. Blacks can tolerate a lower number and still not be in trouble than other people. Well, you know, race is, is, is not, that's, that's, that's not a biological factor. And that assumption, I mean, look at all the differences, even if it, there, there may be some bearing on something, but look at all of the differences among us. Can one factor, you know, really help to determine across our entire race who is in trouble with their kidneys and who's not? And over the last couple of years, actually, the American Society of Nephrology and the National Kidney Foundation uh, have, have led a round of discussions, and we've been part of this discussions to say, this needs to change because the result of it, which is what's really important, is that because there's this factor that, that says that blacks can tolerate kind of a lower functioning kidney before they're in trouble, is that you end up being later diagnosed and later getting the care that you need, which means that it gives more time for your kidney progression um, to move to kidney failure. And that's what we want to stop. You want the earliest diagnosis possible if you're having any kind of health issue. And so now there's a lot of work going on to say, you know, how do we change this formula? You don't want to throw the whole thing out. It is a very useful, I mean, you, you want that useful indicator. We have an indicator for high blood pressure, for diabetes, for weight issues. We need a, a useful indicator for kidney function, but it needs to be useful for all populations, not just for one population. And that really brings us to another thing, which is that when you look at the disproportionate effect of kidney disease on African-Americans, and then you look at the development of new therapies and other kind of research that's going on, we need to make sure that as that research is developed, even from the beginning, even as the research design is completed, that African-Americans need to be part of that conversation and African-Americans need to be included in those clinical trials so that when there is a, um, a therapy that's taken to the FDA for approval, that therapy and those results that are presented include African-Americans to the extent that they have the disease so that they are also therapy useful for us, not at the end, backing into how do we adjust this now that we've decided to approve it for African-Americans, but from the very beginning. And so one of the things that we're doing at the American Kidney Fund, and again, you can go to our website, we want to educate people to understand what clinical trials are about. We want to give you enough information so that you can decide whether a clinical trial is appropriate for you. And then we want to we partner with uh, biopharma companies to keep abreast of the clinical trials that are ongoing. And we have links on our website to go to them so that you can learn more. Um, there, are, there are so many issues that bring about the inequity in outcomes and the inequity in access. 
And I think this really is, you mentioned the word opportunity a while ago, that if we open our eyes, there are opportunities here for us to do something that's positive for our communities and for ourselves and our families. Yes, it does not have to be the final say so that you are that you you're going to have kidney failure or that you must live with chronic disease or that you have no ability to move into a more preventative measure before you get to a first stage kidney disease. And I love the fact that you mentioned clinical trials, because I think sometimes when we think about clinical trials, we think about um prodding us and, 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 and loading us with medications to see how it responds in our bodies. But your website is so informative that there are different types of clinical trials that we need African-Americans and people in uh, communities of color in particular, as well as all individuals participating in a variety of different types of clinical trials, because that's where we get the more holistic data set to give us the direction on how to build um, or how to formulate uh, treatment opportunities or treatment plans or medicines and, and strategies for uh, treating chronic disease and, uh, and uh, kidney disease and kidney failure. And, you know, just a few that I thought were quite interesting were, of course, the treatment. Those are the new medicines. Um, and I think people think of clinical trials from that vantage point and are scared off. But, you know, there's diagnostic and, and screening trials studies, as your, as your website says, the best way to, to diagnose and detect the disease and health condition of uh, kidney disease. Um, quality of life trials, can you imagine that? Very, very important. Um, what's the side effect? What's the issues relating to, let's say, diabetes, uh, excuse me, diabetes as well as dialysis, the impact on that patient's well being and their daily uh, quality of life and functioning? that may keep them focused on treatment, on their treatment plan, may keep them focused on developing a healthy lifestyle, may cause them to derail and therefore be moving into something more serious like chronic, uh, uh, excuse me, like uh, kidney failure. Um, we obviously there are differences in how people yeah. respond to medication and we hear hearing about the different ways of approaching the EGFR and um, different kinds of medication that uh, so it's really important for us to be involved. We, last week we spoke about a particular medicine for congestive heart failure that works in African-Americans that didn't work very well in the rest of the population. So it's really critical that, that we um, participate in clinical trials. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and in doing so, can you tell us now what the Kidney uh, Fund is doing in terms of educating around how to prevent or some of the things that we don't know about some of your actual programs um, related to the unknown causes of kidney disease. How do we become more educated in that regard? Our, 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 web, our website is always our gold standard. And uh, we are, in fact, uh, we've been working for two years now on revamping our website, and we're going to be unveiling a new one in about a month or so. And we're really excited about that because it's going to be even easier to uh, even easier to, to navigate. Um, we will continue, especially on the legislative front, to push for changes um, to enhance research uh, about these causes and not to make the assumption that because I've got high blood pressure or diabetes, that that must be the cause. And it may be a contributing cause, but we've got to get to the underlying what's 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 really causing this so that we get the appropriate treatment. So you don't have the, I mean, to get a kidney transplant, um, you know, mm -hmm. it's so wonderful if you, it's, it's a new lease on life uh, if you're in kidney failure. And then to lose it, not because of anything that you did, but because of what was not known, is just heartbreaking. And so we've got to get to those underlying causes. You, you talked about having, talking about um, um, heart issues last month. There is, you know, our bodies are not little um, um, little cells um, in terms of how they are divided. All these things work together, interact. They work together, absolutely. And one major factor in kidney disease uh, is heart disease. These things feed on each other. We talk about high blood pressure. High blood pressure causes kidney disease, kidney failure, but the reduction and the functioning of your kidneys increases your blood pressure. And so these things, these things feed on each other. And so we've got to look at our bodies as a whole 
and understand we as individuals we have to understand what's our proclivity to different kinds of diseases and again you go back to what are the lifestyle changes uh diet exercise not smoking not drinking in excess all those kinds of things you could take any disease and doing those things will help you with that outcome but then you also have in all fairness people and this is particularly true among african americans who have such a strong family history of certain diseases we had a we have a patient advocate from north carolina um who was himself a nurse every aunt and uncle that he had and he came from a very large family had been on dialysis and he knew and was very attentive to his health being a nurse and understanding his family background and despite his best efforts he went into kidney failure mm. And you know that's why the research is really so critical to understand what's going on here when you are, you know, uh, when you're following the healthcare regimen, when you're following the, the medications that you should be taking, when you're exercising, when you're eating right, and you still are, you know, subject to kidney failure. What else can you do? What we need to fill in to answer those questions. So, and, and it's particularly true in the African-American community. And I know Dr. Christensen can talk about this much better than I, that sometimes high blood pressure can be almost untreatable. You can't bring it down. It's, it, yes. Even yeah. in my own family, we're, we're, we have um, someone that just went on dialysis mm -hmm. because of the difficulty. In, and this person is a health professional but the difficulty in, in controlling that person's blood pressure ended up, he ended up with end stage renal disease. You know, and in the Virgin Islands, uh, one of the things that we don't have much of is uh, peritoneal dialysis or home dialysis. And um, I know that uh, that's another focus of AKF to try to increase the ability for individuals to be able to dialyze at home. Do you want to say a word about that? Yes, I would love to, because it gives me a chance to talk about what we're doing on health equities. Equity. Um, AKF is, is 50 years old, 51 years old this year. And we have always been about health equities uh, because we're dealing with a population primarily that has financial challenges, getting health care, and because of the incidence of the disease, prevalence of the disease among people of color. So we've always been doing this. But as we looked at the impact of COVID and we looked at the national conversation that started last year after the George uh, Floyd murder, we, we said we need to step back because despite everything that we're doing and others are doing, we're certainly not getting the outcome that we want. What can we do better? And we came up with a, with a four point plan um, that where we really want to focus and one of them has to make sure there, there are gaps um, in the access that, um, that African-Americans and other people of color have to home dialysis, including peritoneal dialysis. Um, we want to close that gap. There are gaps in the access to transplants. We want to close that gap. There are gaps in participation in clinical trials. We are focusing on that. Um, there is the whole issue of increasing awareness and education and empowering people to do something early on about kidney disease. So those are the four areas that we are particularly focusing on as part of our health initiative. Um, early detection and prevention, um, access to home dialysis in all forms, greater access to transplants, and increased participation in clinical trials so that the therapies that are developed are appropriate uh, for our communities. I think that's outstanding. And if we could give a global, you know, cheers to the American Kidney Fund, I mean, it would just be uh, remarkable because this is uh, a yeoman's work. And we know that you cannot do it without strategic partners, donors, and the community at large. And one of the programs that I thought was so important because it's a program that I can actually achieve becoming, and that is a, a kidney health coach. Um, and wouldn't it be amazing if we can have kidney health coaches in our families, because then we'll be, we will be talking about diabetes. We will absolutely be talking about um, uh, high blood pressure, but we also will be educating everyone in our family, particularly those with predispositions around 
and having kidney disease to actually understand the what, the how, and how do we prevent and how do we become that much smarter about taking care of our bodies and those in the community. So I just wanted to touch on, you know, that particular program is one of the preventative ways because I thought it was so outstanding that it's a four module program mm -hmm. that actually gives you what you need by way of education. You receive a continuing education or you receive a certificate, but it's a program that I, as a lay person, not a clinician, I'm not a nurse, doctor, or uh, I'm a, a, someone that has come from the medical community as an exec health administrator, manager, executive. So health is important to me from that perspective as well. But I could become a health, a kidney health coach. You could become a certified kidney health coach. And we have the kit that you can get it. And during this pandemic is such a great time to do that. As families are beginning to come back together, you know, and you're having these conversations, let's let's integrate that into these conversations. Let's even build some games around it to you know, lots of the facts that we've talked about today. None of us knew those things. Maybe Dr. Christensen did, uh, but Linda, you and I did not know those things a few years ago. And 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 that knowledge really is power. The uh, the kidney health coach toolkit is online. It is free. We have staff who will gladly work with you in terms of working through details and helping you set up something. If you've got a family reunion coming up and you want to make this part of that family reunion, what better way of spending some time at a, a Black family reunion than talking about health care? That is an Especially. outstanding idea. We should really challenge every listener and every viewer to go to the website kidneyfund.org and have someone designated in your family as that health person, whether they are a clinician or not, meaning they are already a, a degreed individual in the health provision space, um, to become just that. Um, how long is that program? Is it a, a couple of weeks, a couple of months, a year, or more compressed? Or um, it's actually? an ongoing program. It's an ongoing. We've had it for a number of years. Uh, we just revamped the entire kit, and it is it is available for. There's a lay version and a professional version. Um, we we used to go into communities before COVID and do much of this ourselves. Well, we can't go out now, so we're we're enlisting others who can be. Our, our legs, our arms, our ears, et cetera, to go out and do that. And what, you know, if, if you were doing it with your family, your family is going to listen to you a lot more seriously than they are a stranger anyway. And so it's a wonderful way to share that information. You can also go to our website and find that we have webinars. We have webinars for professional health care providers, but we also have webinars um, for lay people. We have webinars for patients, for, uh, for, for family caregivers. Uh, for others, so that we want you. Um, our job um, and our and our whole being is around making sure that people know what kidney disease is. We talked this morning about what do your kidneys do, what do they not do when they're not functioning properly, and what's the result of that, and what do you do about that? And that's that's what we are in the business of doing, you know, day in and day out, trying to get that information across so that we all individually take up the mantle of trying to do something about fighting kidney disease. And I'm so impressed by the fact that you mentioned something earlier about uh, the patient advocate, because you're correct. It, it, you know, sometimes we do listen to our families, but for sure, we're going to listen to someone who's already walked in that those shoes. And the American Kidney Fund has what I think is one of the um, more robust programs out here, your ambassador program, mm -hmm. your advocacy network. Is that a network where um, a kidney disease survivors or thrivers or those who have had transplant, all of the above are part of that? Particular all of the above. Anyone who wants to work with us to fight kidney disease. Can join it. We've got over 17,000 people uh, who have joined us. They are patients, they are caregivers, they are friends, they are loved ones. They are just interested people who want to understand the disease. We carry on conversations online with them, even on the phone. I know that's an old fashioned kind of communications vehicle, but we do talk individually to people. We call upon them to come to Washington to talk to uh, congressional leaders like the, uh, Dr. Christensen was. Uh, we take them to the states to help state lawmakers understand what does it mean to have kidney disease and how can you as my elected official help me deal with that? 
they talk with the media because we want the public to understand this disease. You know, one, one thing that I want to say, and I know our time is running out, is this is the fastest growing non-communicable disease in this country. And 90, over 90% 90 of those who have it don't know it. This is really urgent and, you know, absolutely no exaggeration. It is urgent. Over 90% of those who have kidney disease at some stage and level who are having symptoms that they're not necessarily associating with kidney disease because there's something presenting. Or who may not have symptoms. Or may, who may not even have because symptoms. Because many don't. Mm -hmm. Many don't. Mm -hmm. My goodness. And yeah. so what's the economic toll? We have to get yeah. that conversation oh. to the last Absolutely. Minute. The, let's talk about the family's economic toll. We are talking about people over half of whom are still in their prime earning years. They've got spouses and children and bills and houses and everything to take care of. And moving into kidney failure in the vast majority of cases means that you're no longer able to work. I can't tell my employer that I want a job, but I can't show up three days a week because I've got to go to dialysis. They're not going to keep me on board that way. So my income is suddenly cut off. The economic impact of that on my family is, is just overwhelming. The impact in lost productivity in our economy, the impact on our healthcare system. Um, people who are in kidney failure are about 1% of the people who are on Medicare, but they take up about 7% of total spending in Medicare. And a grand is one of the fastest growing areas. That's the economic impact. Well, we we know that the American Kidney Fund also has financial assistance. You mentioned that at the top of our program. Can you touch on that? Because that is a massive resource. And then we all need to just open up our wallets and become donors. Absolutely. We're fortunate in that we have a program called the Health Insurance Premium Program. And we will pay health insurance premiums for low-income people who are in kidney failure or who've recently had transplants, low-income people mean you know they cannot afford to get health care, and we will pay their health insurance premiums so long as we have resources. Um, the we have many other programs as well. We've talked about a lot of the education programs, our, our efforts in the in the, in the research world, um, our efforts with regard to unknown causes of kidney disease education, and, and our outreach to policymakers. I mean, we just had a meeting about how we would respond to some of the um, proposals that are about to come out. Right. We earlier last year. We played a critical role together with Dr. Christensen's help in terms of making sure that people who are on dialysis would be at, at the front of the line in getting the vaccines. Unbelievably, despite the fact that COVID was having a greater impact on people on dialysis than any other disease population, there was no priority given to getting vaccines to this population until with Dr. Christensen, Christensen's help, we were able to get our voice heard in the White House and get them moving on that. And we uh, have you. People we, can contribute. I do want to make this plug. Yes. If you're having a family reunion and you want to do something, maybe you, we have something called Kidney Nation. We will help you to set up your own fundraiser, however you want to do that. Or if you just want to go to, on our website and click a button that says donate. 97 cents of every dollar that comes into the American Kidney Fund goes out for patient assistance and education programs. Not We have a very, very small uh, overhead. 97 well, cents goes out for programs. Well, and, I've been been and we've been recognized for, for that. For that, and and I I just I just completely applaud everything, Miss Burton from the American Kidney Fund, President and CEO, Dr. Christensen. You are a dream come true to all of us because you still are advocating even in your retirement. You are moving and grooving, and we thank you. And we thank those for you being here today. And we thank all the efforts. And we ask everyone to go out to the kidneyfund.org website and become uh, involved. This has been the health, wellness, and lifestyle segment of uh, Reset on our TV network, And we look forward to seeing you next Wednesday. Until then, be safe and get into the health now. Thank you.